Hello to everyone watching us uh, here in uh, WHO headquarters in Geneva for the regular press conference on uh, COVID-19. Uh, uh, we have, as we had in the previous days, simultaneous translation in uh, six UN languages plus Portuguese. So we hope uh, we will get questions in those uh, languages. And I would like to thank interpreters who are here uh, with us today. Uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Tedros, WHO Director General, Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, Technical Lead and Head of Emergency uh, Program, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mike Ryan, we also have uh, Mr. Steve Solomon, Principal Legal Officer, uh, in case questions come uh, for him. Before we uh, open the, uh, before I give the remarks to, 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 to uh, give the floor to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks, just to remind you that uh, we have been sending you uh, press releases as well as the as invitation for press conferences of our regional offices and uh, uh, on activities from our different uh, sections. So I'll give the floor to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Ten days ago, I joined President Emmanuel Macron President Ursula von der Leyen and Melinda uh, Gates to launch the SET Accelerator to support the development, production, and equitable distribution of vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics against COVID-19. Today, leaders from 40 countries all over the world came together to support the SET Accelerator through the COVID-19 Global Response International Pledging event hosted by the European Commission. During today's event, some 7.4 billion euros was pledged for research and development for vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics. This was a powerful and inspiring demonstration of global solidarity. Today, countries came together not only to pledge their financial support, but to also pledge their commitment to ensuring all people can access life-saving tools for COVID-19. Accelerating development of the products, but at the same time, access to all. Recent advances in science are enabling the world to move at incredible speed to develop these tools. But the true measure of success will not only be how fast we can develop safe and effective tools, it will be how equally we can distribute them. None of us can accept a world in which some people are protected while others are not. Everybody should be protected. None of us are safe until all of us are safe. The potential for continued waves of infection of COVID-19 across the globe demands that every single person on the planet be protected from this disease. WHO remains committed to working with all countries and partners to accelerate the development and production of vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics and to ensure their equitable distribution. This is an opportunity for the world to come together to confront a common threat, but also to forge a common future. A future in which all people enjoy the right to the highest attainable standard of health and the products that deliver that right. That's what we mean by health for all. We have been saying it for the last more than 70 years since the WHO was created. 
But I think, given the experience we have now and the difficulties we're going through, it's time to make it happen, health for all. But one of the best tools is also one of the most basic, clean hands. The simple act of cleaning hands can be the difference between life and death and remains one of the most important public health measures for protecting individuals, families, and communities against COVID-19 and many other diseases. Tomorrow is Hand Hygiene Day, a reminder of the importance of clean hands for health workers and for all of us. At the same time, we must remember that millions of people around the world are not able to practice this most basic of precautions. Around the world, less than two thirds of healthcare facilities are equipped with hand hygiene stations, and three billion people lack soap and water at home. This is an old problem that requires new and vastly increased attention. If we are to stop COVID-19 or any other source of infection and keep health workers safe, we must dramatically increase investments in soap, access to water, and alcohol-based hand rubs. Tomorrow also marks the International Day of the Midwife. This is an opportunity to remember the vital role that midwives play all over the world in providing safe and effective care for women and newborns. Research shows that interventions delivered by midwives can avert over 80% of all maternal deaths, stillbirths, and neonatal deaths. The service of midwives is actually a lifeline for many. Childbirth can be one of the most precious moments in a woman's life, but it can also be one of the most dangerous, as you know. Midwives are essential for guiding and caring for women through their entire pregnancy and the critical moment of childbirth. But we need more midwives in all countries, especially low-resource countries. To mark Hand Hygiene Day and the International Day of the Midwife, we're calling all people to stop what they're doing at noon tomorrow to clap for nurses and midwives and thank them for their role in delivering safe and effective care, especially during this pandemic. They're risking their life and to protect or to give life to others. Several countries are now starting to ease so-called lockdown and stay-at-home orders but our common commitment to basic measures such as cleaning hands and physical distancing cannot be relaxed. Nor can the commitment to the tools that are the foundation of the response to find, isolate, test, and care for every case and trace every contact and to ensure health systems have the capacity they need to provide safe and effective care for all. But just as the number of new cases and deaths is declining in some countries, it's mounting in others. That's why today's pledging event is so important. This virus will be with us for a long time and we must come together to develop and share the tools to defeat it. But of course, today's event only covers one part of the response. 
for research and development in vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics. In the weeks and months ahead, we will need much more to meet the demand for personal protective equipment, medical oxygen, and other essential supplies. Later this week, WHO will launch its updated strategic preparedness and response plan, which will provide an update of the resources WHO needs to support the international response and international and national action plans to the, to the end of 2020. WHO is grateful to the many countries and donors who supported the first strategic and response preparedness and response plan. And we are also grateful to the more than 300,000 individuals, corporations, and foundations who have contributed to the Solidarity Response Fund, which has generated more than 210 million US dollars in just six weeks. As my friend Boris Johnson said during today's pledging event, we are in this together, and together we will prevail. We will prevail through national unity and global solidarity. The antidotes to this virus are national unity and global solidarity. The antidote to this virus is the human spirit. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tedros, for these opening remarks. We will now open the floor uh, for questions. I will remind journalists to be uh, a very brief and ask only one question so we can try to uh, take as many as possible. And again, you can ask the question in, uh, uh, in six uh, UN languages plus Portuguese. For journalists who are on Zoom, you will need to go to settings to find your language. And for, because of a bug we have, Arabic is under Korean. So uh, if you want to listen in Arabic, you have to click on Korean. That's a bug that we have in a Zoom, and it's not really our fault. Uh, we will start with uh, EFE news agency. Isabel is online. Isabel? Yes, do you hear me? Uh, yes. Thank you. Yeah, gracias. Voy a hacer la pregunta. Yes, I'm going to ask the question in Spanish. Thank you for taking this question. In several countries in various regions, some in Latin America, pharmacies are selling diagnostic tests for coronavirus so that people can carry out the test at home. And in some countries, it's being done with authorization from the health authorities, and in other countries, it's more or less informal. And I'd like to know if the WHO advises that people carry out their own self-testing, if they think that these tests are reliable, and if what they see is the risk that someone with a false negative result, if the tests are not reliable, and so someone could think that they are healthy and could then transmit the virus further since lockdown measures are starting to be relaxed in many countries. Thank you for the question. So. Um uh, there, there are a number of diagnostic tests that are currently available and are being sold globally. Um, in fact, there's hundreds of them. Um, and the tests that you're referring to are these molecular tests or these PCR-based tests um, that can diagnose somebody as having active infection. Um, it's difficult to answer that question because I don't know exactly which tests you're referring to. What is really important is that the tests that are being used by any governments or being sold, that there's clear um, results of how well these tests work. Um, there are the possibilities that if they are not validated, we call validated, where we test them against known samples of whether the samples are indeed positive or negative. It's very difficult to know if the test result that you're getting is a true result. And as you've highlighted, there are risks associated with having a false positive in thinking that you are infected and you are indeed not. And more importantly, if you test false negative, um, 
where in fact you are infected and the test tells you that you're not. Um, so there are some risks associated with being 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 sold over the counter. Having said that, um, you know the, the the ingenuity, the the rapid development of these tests is very positive, um, and and we welcome this innovation. We welcome the speed at which these tests are being made available. But it is important that they're validated. It's important that we really understand how well they work. Um, bottom line, though, is that everyone um, that is out there needs to adhere to public health measures regardless. Um, these include hand hygiene that the DG has just mentioned, and you've heard us mention well with washing your hands with soap and water or an alcohol spray alcohol-based rub, uh, practice physical distancing, so where you're physically distant from another person, um, adhering to the public health measures that are put in place by governments, um, practicing respiratory etiquette. These are the things that must be adhered to all the time um, while we work through the use of some of these tests that are, that are, that are coming online. Thank you very much. Uh Dr. Van Kerkhove, hope this answers the question uh, from Isabel, and it was on self-testing. Uh, uh, next question is from Joanne from uh, Meetings Today. Joanne, can you hear us? Uh, Joanne, can you unmute yourself, yeah, please? Sorry, I did. Okay, Thanks. please. Thank you very now. Thank you. Um, meetings and conventions are um, part of the tour and travel industry. And we are incredibly confused about how WHO classifies mass gatherings um, around the world and in the U.S. Groups um, don't know what that means. We're finding different standards within the United States. And I just saw someone mentioned um, what France is doing in terms of the ability to travel to meetings. We need guidelines about how WHO defines mass gathering and, and how we're going to go forward. Thank you. So thank you for the question. I will start, maybe Mike would like to supplement. Um, so the, the question around mass gatherings, there, there's, there's different ways in which people are defining um, gatherings, just gatherings in general, in terms of you've seen different um, governments put in place more than five people, no more than 10 people, no more than 50 people. Mass gatherings are obviously much larger than that. What we do is we, we have put out guidance which provides a risk assessment-based approach that evaluates each, guidance, each uh, gathering um, as it is defined, uh, as it is developed. What is the gathering itself? Where is it taking place? Uh, how many people are involved in it? Is there any way in which it can be um, done remotely or through, through video? Um, is there a way it can be postponed? And so what we're trying to do is lay out the criteria in which those decisions can be made. Those decisions must be made on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, because not all situations are the same. Um, the, the area in which they are carried out uh, have, have different ventilations, have, some are outdoors, some are indoors, so it depends. Um, it's an unsatisfactory answer because we can't give you a yes or no, but what we try to do is we try to outline all of their criteria that you would need to take to be able to make that decision. Um, the same holds true for travel. You know, the same holds true for holding meetings some places. All of those decisions need to, need to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis to determine if indeed that meeting needs to take place, and if so, how that could be done safely. Uh, thank you very much, um, Dr. Van Kikorf. Uh, next question is uh, Radio France Internationale. Uh, Jeremy, can you hear us? Uh, hello, do we have uh, Jeremy from uh, RFE? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Um, thank you. Uh, I just had a, a quick question uh, regarding mass gatherings. Also, uh, I, I heard that France is considering uh, reopening uh, movie theaters, uh, for instance, and I would like to have your, your opinion on that. Do you think this kind of, measures, uh, this kind of measure is too early? because uh, we can think of uh, mass gatherings too in, in movie theaters where hundreds of people are, are sitting in the same place. So do you consider it to be a good measure or not? Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, I think we need to make um, a distinction here between what would classically be regarded as mass gatherings, which are large religious events, 
uh, big sporting events where thousands and thousands of people come together and approach one point and then leave from a point and they're coming potentially from across national boundaries or within national boundaries. So they're gathering events when lar and they're large scale, they're often multinational and uh, require and involve the movement, not just the presence of many people in an area, but potentially the movement of people to and from those areas. Um, movie theatres, churches and other gatherings are more localised events and they have to be dealt with within the, the, the local context. <clears throat> um, WHO can't prescribe to individual countries what exactly is to be done in every single context. What we do advise is anywhere where people gather, where they cannot maintain social distance or physical distance or appropriate hygiene, then there's always a risk in the presence of the virus that the, you may amplify the virus. And we've seen that and there's plenty of evidence that that um, has happened uh, in the past. So as countries open up their economies and open up their societies, and as they look at different gatherings, be they religious or social gatherings that occur, they've got to calibrate the risks associated with those gatherings which are based on how much virus is circulating in the area, so what is the absolute risk of exposure, and then what are the increased risks of being exposed in an environment where there are a number of people who cannot maintain physical distance or potentially maintain uh, hygiene uh, or other measures. <clears throat> um, and you can see within that that many uh, governments and companies, private <clears throat> and public, are looking at what are the what are the measures that need to be put in place in, for example, restricting access to less than full capacity or some proportion of capacity, to having uh, spacing between seating, to having extra um, hygiene and clean, uh, disinfection measures put in place, having online ticketing. Uh, there's lots of different measures that for each individual service or each individual gathering can be put in place, the same with, with churches. So again, as the Director General uh, has said in his speech, uh, exiting the more severe public health and, so and social distancing or physical distancing measures or the lockdowns or stay-at-home orders and allowing people to re-engage in social and econ economic life must come with a risk-managed approach. How do we minimize the risk of transmission between individuals while obviously uh, trying to maximize the way in which people can re-engage in their normal lives. And that is determined by the presence of the virus, that is determined by the risk of the encounter or the risk of the particular environment which people will come to, and the means and the, 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 the ability of both the government, local governments, communities, and the private sector owners to minimize those risks to participants or to clients. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ryan. Uh, next question comes from Italy. Uh, Luca Rossini from Rai. Luca? Luca? Hello, Hello. can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, so uh, regarding the, cont the contact tracing, uh, tracing, what would you suggest uh, uh, to country like Italy to integrate manual and uh, digital contact tracing in order to speed up uh, not only the national process of, of contact tracing, but even the, the broader process of international pro, uh, process of contact tracing, that, that, which is very important when the border will be opened again. Uh, thank you. And I, and I think this is a, a challenge that's, that's facing many countries. Uh, right now, so I won't answer it in the specific context of Italy. Um, I think when you speak to uh, professionals in, in Korea and Singapore about what they did to make their contact tracing more effective, they will first and foremost tell you that they got more boots on the ground, that they went back to the basics of public health, finding cases at community level, community-based surveillance, putting more surveillance officers out there, following up with people, making the phone calls, knocking on people's doors, finding out who could have been exposed, and ensuring that those who are suspected are tested and isolated, and then ensure that those who are in contact are given that information, 
so they can protect themselves and their families and are offered either uh, a home quarantine or quarantine in, 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 a, in a third place. And this has all been aimed at breaking the chains of transmission. If someone who is infected has no further contact with other people other than protected health workers, their chances of passing on the disease are minimized. If a contact who is developing disease is aware of that and reports symptoms uh, immediately, the chances of them infecting someone else uh, decreases uh, very, very importantly. And this is all going to that number that everyone talks about, the R number or the R naught, the capacity of one individual to infect any other individual. Contact tracing and case finding is not about surveillance or interrupting people's lives. It's about trying to identify those individuals who are sick and in trying to ensure that those sick individuals are tested and cared for and that anyone who is in contact with them is monitored and then subsequently tested and cared for if needed. In doing that, we reduce their um, uh, role in spreading the disease uh, to others. That is essentially a human process, and it needs to have a human face, uh, because these are difficult times for cases and for contacts. What has emerged, and what WHO, for example, for a number of years, has been working on a system called GoData, which is an integrated information system, which is app-based, which allows public health authorities to integrate all of the different data, the case data, the contact data, the laboratory data. And we've rolled that out to a number of countries. Uh, over the last number of months and, and with increasing frequency now during COVID-19 and are willing to, to offer that to any country that wishes to implement it. The addition of uh, apps that people themselves can have on their telephones that will give them information on their disease status or notify them if they've been in contact with an individual that, in, that is infected can obviously enhance the effectiveness of contact tracing and surveillance. Um, and we've seen various examples of that emerge around the world and be put to use. They are an additional um, measure that will potentially enhance the efficiency of the contact tracing process, but they won't do it by themselves. Uh, in doing that, and we're very grateful for those countries and those companies and those innovators who are working on such tools, and we're talking with them every day, uh, what we need to ensure as we roll out those tools Number one, that they enhance that process, and they're not seen as a replacement for shoe leather epidemiology. They're not seen as a replacement for the basic human workforce, the army we need to go out there and find cases. Uh, they can enhance the work of that workforce, but they can't do the work of that workforce. Um, if we add those tools and give an extra uh, boost to that process and become more efficient, then we'll get rid of this virus more quickly. But we also have to consider uh, and very carefully within this, that these tools must be used for that purpose and that purpose alone. And we have to take into account people's personal uh, data protection, protection of, of their data, uh, protection of their privacy, and ultimately protection of their human rights. Uh, I think all countries are trying to approach this in a very balanced manner, but we do believe that such tools are useful. We're very, very grateful to see the innovation but we are very, very keen to stress that IT tools do not replace the basic public health workforce that is going to be needed to, to trace, test, isolate, and quarantine. Thank you very much. Uh, from Italy, we go to uh, Brazil. Uh, Ana Pinto from Fola de Sao Paulo. Ana? Yeah, hi. Thanks for for taking my question. I'll ask in Portuguese, so you provided the translator. So, um, uh, nos últimos... In recent days, some data has shown that there are countries that uh, haven't really got a... They haven't got just a single curve of the illness and the death, but two, one where there's a more rapid movement with the richer inhabitants and then others where the poorer part of the population continues to grow as a curve. So I want to know if this is a concern for the World Health Organization and if you have registered this phenomenon and seen it in other countries and if that has an influence on the public policy in those countries when the most vulnerable populations have less of a voice and less of uh, representation in public policy. Thank you. 
Maria may go into the detail, but I think it is as to whether or not we're, we're, we're seeing uh, this phenomenon. But it is very important, uh, and uh, the Director General has said this many times, no one is safe until everyone is safe, and we cannot leave anyone behind. And we have to absolutely ensure that public health surveillance and testing is available to all who need it. Uh, and it is very important that testing is not seen as the, as the, as the purview of the, the wealthy or those who can afford it. This isn't about testing people from a clinical perspective only. This is about testing people so we know where the virus is. Uh, and therefore, if, the, if people see the purpose of testing in just getting my diagnosis so then I can go and get pay for treatment, then that in, is a distortion of the ultimate purpose of testing. Testing is aimed at doing two things. One is giving people with symptoms an opportunity to be tested so they can get the proper care, but it also triggers a whole series of activities to understand the transmission and dynamics of the virus. So if access to testing is determined by, by resources, then there's going to be a, a very skewed understanding of where the virus actually is. And that's very dangerous. Uh, that's dangerous from a public health perspective. Not only is it inequitable, uh, it is also dangerous. Uh, so it's very important that, that testing is made available to those who need it. And in fact, in some cases, uh, I believe that testing should be more available in areas where people don't have the opportunity to physical distance, where they may have higher rates of infection and in fact may also have higher rates of death if they are infected. We've seen with many vulnerable populations, we've seen with ethnic minorities, we've seen with indigenous people that they may have higher death rates when they are infected because of underlying conditions. Because because of long-standing underlying conditions. So it is all the more important that we have early testing of people who may have those underlying conditions. So if anything, testing should be prioritized in areas where there's underprivilege, where there's overcrowding, where there's poverty. Uh, but it is, uh, I, I'm not aware of this emerging systematically in our data, Maria, but, uh, but certainly if this phenomenon is happening, then this is a very wrong direction because it is not only inequitable and unjust, it is also uh, a dangerous direction because you will not know where the virus is and you will not be able to detect those who need, need care the most. Maybe to supplement what Mike has said, so the, the speed of, in which the virus can transmit relates to the contact between infected people. And so we have seen in a number of urban areas the ability for the virus to spread. We've also seen this in less populated areas. Um, it, just because there's an urban area that has a seeding of this virus or the virus being detected doesn't mean that it has to take off. Um, the ability of our, uh, our ability to suppress transmission relates to detecting people with the virus, so it, it relates to testing. It relates to the surveillance strategy that is in a country and, and how, how countries are actually looking for cases. Um, it relates to uh, the ability to isolate known cases. If those cases who are known are isolated in a healthcare facility and are treated, are, are provided care, depending on the severity of their sy symptoms, then they are taken out of the general population and, and they can't transmit to other people. If contact tracing is happening comprehensively, where contacts of known cases are, are identified and those contacts are quarantined, then if they develop symptoms, they're already in quarantine. They don't have the ability to infect somebody else. So it's all about the ability of this virus to find another person to infect. And if we stop that, if we break that chain of transmission, that's what we mean. We actually mean taking, breaking uh, one, the, the chain of transmission from one person who's infected to passing it on to another one, to pass on to another, to pass on another. If we're able to break that, then we can prevent that from transmitting further. But it is important to know how cases are being detected in a country. It's important to know how, once they are detected, how they are cared for and isolated, and if contact tracing is, is occurring. Um, but just because a virus is identified in an urban area it doesn't mean that it has to take off. And we've seen a number of countries that have been able to prevent that from happening, whether it's through the public health measures or it's through these more advanced stay-at-home orders. Um, but it is possible to suppress transmission and to break those chains of transmission. 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ryan and Dr. Van Kerkhoff. This was a question from uh, for Hadis Sao Paulo about inequality, social inequalities, and COVID-19. Uh, next question uh, is coming from Savio Rodriguez from Goa Chronicle. Uh, Savio, can you hear us? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, my question is for Dr. Tedros. On December 31st, 2019, the Taiwan Center for Disease Control sent an email to the World Health Organization informing WHO of its understanding of the disease and requesting for more information. In that email, they used the word atypical pneumonia, which they claim is a word commonly used to refer to SARS, a disease transmitted between humans. Why did WHO not take Taiwan CDC observation seriously? Is my question. Thank you. Thank you, Savio. I think uh, Mr. Solomon will take this one. I may follow. Um, thank you, Tariq. And uh, thanks uh, very much for the question. It's appreciated because it gives us an opportunity to set the record straight, which I'd like to do right away. And then I'd also like to address uh, questions of uh, their participation at WHO meetings, because these questions continue to come up as well. Um, so did Taiwan warn WHO on 31 December 2019? The answer is no, they didn't. They did send an email, but that email was not a warning. It was a request for more information on cases of atypical pneumonia reported by news sources. They sent that request through the IHR system that Taiwan, China, and all IHR focal points are part of. The email asked for more information, more information about news reports that WHO and most public health services already knew about. Others, in fact, sent similar emails that same day, also asking for more information. These reports about atypical pneumonia cases came from Wuhan itself on the internet, and they came through a website run by ProMed. That's an acronym for Program for Monitoring Emerging Diseases. The reports were therefore already available, and the Taiwanese email just requested in very kind terms more information. Why then has this story of warning continued to circulate? Well, the answer to that is in part because of the rules for the IHR system itself. That is the electronic communication system supporting the international health regulations and its focal points from around the world. These focal points around the world are the direct channel to WHO for information about disease outbreaks. The communications are confidential in order to promote openness within the IHR system. So until Taiwan CDC indicated that they didn't expect confidentiality about that email, we couldn't offer de details. Then on 11th of April, that changed. Taiwan's authorities held up the email at a media briefing. Since Taiwan has made the message public, I'll read out the full content today. It reads, and I'm quoting in full, news resources today indicate that at least seven atypical pneumonia cases were reported in Wuhan, China. Their health authorities replied to the media that the cases were believed not SARS. However, the samples are still under examination and cases have been isolated for treatment. I would greatly appreciate it if you have relevant information to share with us, thank you very much in advance for your attention to this matter. Best regards. The email wasn't a warning, and it only contained information that WHO already had picked up from internet reports. It's also important to say that the Wuhan situation had already been captured by WHO on that day, 31 December 2019. WHO activated its incident management protocols the next day on January 1st, and then, along with embedded scientists from other governments, WHO began the work which continues to this day, analyzing the data and seeking additional information. On the 4th of January, WHO provided information about this situation publicly. 
On the 5th of January, WHO shared detailed technical information through this IHR system. This included advice to all member states and all IHR focal points to take precautions to reduce the risk of acute respiratory infections, providing guidance on the basis that there could be human-to-human -human transmission. On the 10th and the 11th of January, WHO published a comprehensive package of guidance on how to detect, test for, and manage cases and protect health workers from potential human-to-human -human transmission based on our previous experience with coronaviruses. And as you know, there was a global press briefing on January 14th where WHO spoke about likely scenarios around human-to-human -human transmission. I hope that's helpful in understanding the December 31st email. We know there are also questions about Taiwan's participation in WHO expert meetings and questions about their participation in the World Health Assembly. WHO is an intergovernmental organization, meaning that countries decide how the, organization, how the organization is structured and on its policies. Some 49 years ago, the UN and WHO decided that there was only one legitimate representative of China within the UN system, and that is the People's Republic of China. That decision still stands. WHO is also a specialized agency of the United Nations and as such aligns with the UN and must do so coherently. The work of WHO staff in line with our constitution is to promote the health of all people everywhere and to assist with but not decide on issues at the World Health Assembly. So. Regarding expert meetings on technical health matters, last year Taiwanese experts were included at eight expert meetings and there were six other informal technical meetings. This year, in response to COVID-19, Taiwanese experts are involved in key groups and networks. We've had telephone conferences with their CDC, Dr. Van Kerkhove and myself, and we'll do so again. And as noted, their IHR contact point links their CDC directly to WHO headquarters. In the COVID-19 response, especially they have had notable successes and we appreciate their contributions. Regarding the World Health Assembly, the next one will be in two weeks, starting on May 18th. The involvement, if any, of Taiwanese observers in that assembly is a question for the 194 governments of WHO. This is not something that WHO Secretariat has authority to decide. And indeed, two countries have already formally proposed that member states consider this matter at the World Health Assembly. And a final word. A lot of attention has focused on Taiwan's participation with WHO, and we understand that. We are also mindful that there are other places, too, that for many different reasons look for connections to WHO. But it is not the role of WHO staff to be involved in geopolitical issues. In fact, our principles of neutrality and impartiality exist to keep us out of those issues and to promote the role of evidence-based science in all our work. Our role even when we operate in sensitive political areas or in complex humanitarian emergencies, is to follow the rules and policies that member states set out and, working within them, to strengthen health systems and access to health care for all people everywhere. Others may want to add to this. Thanks very much. Oh, um, just one small clarification on the issue of atypical pneumonia. Atypical pneumonia is an extremely uh, common form of pneumonia that occurs around the world. There are millions and millions of cases every year. And atypical pneumonia effectively refers to the fact that the cause of the pneumonia is usually atypical or not necessarily diagnosed it's as, as some of the, the normal causes of, of pneumonia, one of the usual causes for a community-acquired pneumonia. Very often they can test negative on first testing and then they're subsequently retested for specific pathogens. And studies I know up to, um, up to 
one third of community acquired pneumonias can be considered to be atypical and that you have other pathogens that are found um, would, would be known as atypical pathogens, pathogens that don't typically cause that type of pneumonia and, and, and certainly at a global level they would most be represented when they're finally diagnosed by Legionnaire, Legionella pneumonia, Chlamydia pneumonia and Mycoplasma pneumonia as the, as the causes which are bacterial causes of atypical pneumonia. So the most common causes of atypical pneumonia are, are bacterial causes and not necessarily uh, 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 viral or others, but obviously viruses can cause atypical pneumonia. But to say that atypical pneumonia is a homonym for SARS is entirely incorrect. If I can also supplement, so just to say in, in the beginning, that email that, that Steve read out did not mention human-to-human -human transmission, um, and I think that is important. But from day one, um, from all of our experience with, with other respiratory pathogens and from SARS, from MERS, you know, you operate on the possibility that that may be possible. And from the beginning, um, with our partners, with our global expert networks, with uh, with all of our internal staff at the three levels of the organization prepared for this. And so even the first notifications that we had through our uh, event information system, which is what Steve has mentioned, which is the IHR mechanism by which we notify all uh, member states and contact points, we talked about protection against acute respiratory infections. And there was details in there about this. And as more information became available and as more details come from the investigations that are taking place, um, we mod you modify uh, the guidance. Having said that, our first technical package of guidance that was issued um, to our emergency directors at all of the regions, to all of the WRs, and made public on our website, um, put out guidance preventing against human-to-human -human transmission. And it focused on uh, transmission via respiratory droplets and contact. And in the situation of healthcare settings, focused on the potential for aerosol transmission or airborne transmission when you have, uh, in the context of aerosol generating procedures. Um, and again, this is, this is based on our experience with other respiratory pathogens, SARS, MERS, influenza. Um, with the, with the first and foremost um, idea to protect our healthcare workers who are caring for patients. Um, and this was before diagnostic tests were even read, widely available. Um, and so what we aimed to do was immediately try to put out information to warn all of our member states and contact points about um, how to find cases through surveillance guidance, how to collect samples safely through our laboratory guidance, um, how to protect healthcare workers who are caring for patients in our infection prevention and control guidance, um, how to care for patients in our clinical management guidance, which was focused on severe respiratory disease. Um, because again, even without information on the details of what disease this might have caused, you anticipate that this would cause a severe disease or could cause a severe disease. And, and lastly, we also put out um, a readiness checklist which was a series of questions which helped all, uh, everyone look at how ready are we? You know, how ready are we for an emerging respiratory pathogen, which is what this was. Um, and we've said previously, um, you know, this, this COVID-19 virus, SARS-CoV-2, turned out to be the latest disease X. And disease X is, is what we are all anticipating. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And the DG has said this before. Um, so this was something that could happen because diseases come from, uh, you know, they spill over from animals and this is, this is happening all the time. Um, but we need to ensure that we put out guidance as quickly as possible to help prevent uh, onward spread, protect people who are caring for those patients. Thank you very much for this uh answer on this topic. Next question is from uh, CNBC. That's uh, Will. Will, can you hear us? Hi. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Uh, I wanted to ask, the DG mentioned earlier uh, about equitable distribution of therapeutics and vaccines. Uh, I wanted to ask about Re Gilead's remdesivir, which received emergency use authorization in the U.S. this past week. Uh, the U.S. government is uh, controlling the supply of remdesivir, remdesivir at the time. Uh, I'm wondering if the WHO would like to comment specifically on that drug. Um, just to say we're, we are grateful that the company Gilead and the, the Director General had direct discussions 
at the highest level to ensure that we were had access to, to the remdesivir drug in order to launch the solidarity trials around the world. Uh, and just to remind everyone that remdesivir is one of the arms of those trials. Uh, we, we welcome the recent data on the, on the, uh, uh, from the randomized control trials uh, that were at the, the randomized control trial that has been done in the United States, and there's uh, signals of hope there for the potential use of the drug. Um, and we will be engaging in, in discussions with uh, Gilead and the U.S. Uh, government as to how uh, this drug may be uh, made more widely available um, as further data emerges on its uh, effectiveness. Uh, uh, but we are grateful for the fact that the drug is within the solidarity trials and that drug was provided by the company for that purpose. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a time for maybe two more questions. So let's uh, try uh, AFP and Nina Larson. Nina? Can we hear Nina? If you can unmute yourself, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, now it's okay. Okay, thank you. And thanks for taking my question. So um, I had a question about um, President Trump and uh, his Secretary of State, uh, Mike Pompeo, have said that they've seen uh, enormous evidence that the novel coronavirus originated in a lab in Wuhan. I'm just wondering if the U.S. has discussed or shared this evidence with the WHO and if the WHO is looking to investigate these claims if or when you're invited to China to, uh, to participate in investigations into the origin of the outbreak. Thanks. So I can start and perhaps Mike would like to supplement. So let me start with the public health importance of really understanding where this uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, the virus that causes COVID-19, uh, comes from. What's really important is for us to understand the, the zoonotic source, what we call the animal source. Um, this is a coronavirus, and coronaviruses circulate in bats, um, and so there's an ancestral link to bats, and that is something that we know based on the genetic sequences of this virus and other coronaviruses that circulate globally. Um, so we know that bats are an ancestral link. What we really need to understand is the intermediate host, the animal that was infected by bats and that infected people in some of these early, in the earliest cases. And that's a very important piece to understand from a public health perspective so that we could prevent that from happening again. Um, we've learned this in MERS, for example, in the beginning. We didn't know the intermediate host for MERS, and there were investigations that were taking place in the Middle East, and there was a link that was made with dromedary camels. Um, there, this happens for a lot of these zoonotic pathogens. And what we need to do is we need to do these, these investigations, these studies, to better understand what is the animal host for COVID-19. Um, we have uh, discussed this with our colleagues in China, um, uh, and we discussed it uh, during the mission that I took part in uh, in February. Um, and one of the recommendations was to be able to do those investigations and do those with our colleagues at FAO and OIE um, and different ministries across China. And this is an important part of, the, of our understanding of how this all began um, so that we could prevent it from happening further. Um, from all of the evidence that we have seen, um, from all of the sequences that are available, and there are, I believe, more than 15,000 full genome sequences available, or close to 15,000, that this virus is of natural origin. Um, but we do need to still find the intermediate host um, in China, and, and that is something we are very supportive of to uh, provide that support to our colleagues in China. Um. And just a supplement on, on your first question. No, we, we have not received any data or specific evidence from the US government relating to the purported origin of the virus. So uh, 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 from our perspective, th this remains speculative, and, uh, and but any, like any evidence-based organization, we will be very uh, willing to receive any information that purports to the origin of the virus because, as Maria said, the origin of the virus is a very important piece of public health information for future control. So uh, if that data and evidence is available, then it will be for the United States government to decide whether and when it can be shared. But it's difficult for WHO to operate 
<clears throat> in an information vacuum in that specific regard. So we focus on what we know, we focus on the evidence we have, and the evidence we have from the sequencing uh, and from all that we have been advised is the, 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 the virus itself is of natural origin, uh, and we need to understand more about that natural origin and particularly about intermediate hosts. Uh, this issue was uh, in one of the recommendations of the Emergency Committee on 30th of January. It was subsequently repeated in the advice the other day. The Director General, when he visited China uh, with, uh, when I was there with him, raised the issue at the, at the highest level. Not as a specific issue, but we've been saying this since the beginning. We have to control this outbreak, and this is the most important thing we have to do. But we have to also understand the origin so that we can uh, put in place the right public health and animal-human interface policies that will prevent this happening again. This is not unique. We have done the same in the Middle East with MERS. We have done the same with Ebola in Africa. Understanding the host uh, animal, understanding the intermediate species, and understanding how to protect human beings in that cycle is exceptionally important. Whether that requires changes in our engagement with the natural environment, whether it requires changes in animal husbandry, when it requires changes along the food chain, we won't know exactly how that is to be managed unless we understand the animal host and the animal intermediate species. Um, and that's an exceptionally important piece of information. Right now we have to deal with the pandemic and we've got to get it under control, but that does not lessen the importance of doing that other work. Uh, we have offered, um, as we do in every case with every country, assistance with carrying out those investigations, and I'm sure our colleagues in OIE and FAO uh, are equally keen to, to, uh, to offer that support. But again, a bit like the mission in, in February, we uh, need to understand that we can learn from Chinese scientists, we can learn uh, from each other, we can exchange knowledge, and we can find the answers together. Uh, if, if this is projected as, as, as an aggressive investigation uh, of wrongdoing, then I believe that's much more difficult to deal with. That's a political issue, that is not a science issue. We see scientists in China communicating, collaborating, around the world right the way through this pandemic. We would like to see that spirit continue and we would like to see scientists at the centre uh, of the exploration of the source of this. Science needs to be at the centre. Uh, science will find the answers. The implications of those answers can be dealt with from a policy and political perspective. Uh, so if we have a science-based investigation and a science-based inquiry as to what the origin species and the intermediate species are, then that will benefit everybody on the planet. Uh, and we believe that can be achieved with the appropriate approach uh, to that uh, very important question. Thank you very much. Uh, let's maybe try to take uh, one more question before we uh, conclude this press briefing. Uh, it's uh, Simon Ateba from Today News Africa. Uh, Simon, can you hear us? Hello, do we have Good Simon? Day. Yeah. Uh, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My name is Simon Ateba from Today News Africa in Washington, D.C. Uh, WHO Africa released a statement uh, not long ago about uh, that WHO welcomes traditional medicine. I wanted Dr. Tedros to expand on that. What do uh, they mean by traditional medicine? Do we mean black magic or what do they mean? And I also wanted uh, WHO to react to the controversial bill being introduced in Nigeria, the infectious disease bill. Do you, are you concerned that some, some government may use the coronavirus to turn their country into uh, a police state. Thank you. Um, what, what WHO and I think our African Regional Office released a statement on this does support the use as we do all over the world of, uh, there's a difference here between what are natural remedies or natural supplements where people take things to feel better and uh, if, if people want to take a honey and lemon drink in order to ward off infectious diseases, that's a very different thing to taking a drug with an active ingredient, whether that's of natural or pharmaceutical origin. What we're talking about here are, 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 are uh, potential 
treatments that have active pharmaceutical ingredients. And an active pharmaceutical ingredient can help you if it's targeted at the virus that's infecting you, but it can also hurt you if it affects any other system and doesn't deal with the virus. So what we try to do in medicine is not make the difference between what are pharmaceutical agents and what are traditional. I think what we found more and more in the world that sometimes what ends up as, a pharma, as, an, age, as an agent uh, or as a drug coming from, from the pharmaceutical side very often starts as a traditional medicine. Aspirin, anti-malarial treatments, many of these came from traditional medicines that were well recognized by communities. And then when the active ingredient is identified, that's often taken and developed and scaled up and put into tablets. So we must recognize that traditional medicine has a value, it has a value both clinically and socially and culturally. But what we do want to make sure is that any of those products that have active pharmaceutical ingredients in them are tested in the same way as normal drugs. And that particularly in the context of, 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 of Africa, we want to make sure that any material, any uh, uh, drug going into the body of an African gets exactly the same testing and safety and efficacy trialing as it would in any other part of the world. So this is not about denying Africans traditional therapies. This is about making sure that those therapies are safe and effective. And WHO will support uh, those researchers who have traditional uh, medicines that are, have some potential or are showing some promise or have some indication that they may work. And we will support them in, in building the necessary clinical trials that can test the safety and efficacy of those, uh, of those potential traditional remedies. This is both as a way to protect people from remedies that may hurt them, but also to select out those remedies that may actually work in this case. Maria? Just to supplement that, uh, you know, I agree with everything Mike has just said, of course, but the, the idea of traditional medicines, particularly for COVID-19, is something that is, is well under investigation. There's hundreds of clinical trials that are ongoing right now, and it is important that these are done um, through these, these types of studies called uh, clinical trials. Um, even within China, the use of traditional medicine, um, many of them are under clinical, uh, clinical trials uh, evaluation right now. Um, and I haven't seen the full statement from our, our regional office, but WHO has been working with a number of uh, research groups to, to ensure that any uh, drugs, any whether it's traditional medicine or whether it's you know Western quote unquote Western medicine, that these are done and evaluated through clinical trials to ensure their safety and their efficacy. And clinical trials should be conducted the same way, no matter where they're conducted, no matter which continent they are conducted on, no matter which individuals that they involve. They need to follow the same scientific and ethical principles all over the world. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, just very, very brief, uh, there are many traditional medicines actually that are beneficial and that's why we have a unit in WHO that uh, um, follows uh, uh, traditional medicine. But as has been said, uh, the use of any traditional medicine should pass through a very rigorous trial like the modern medicine before it's used for uh, uh, anyone. So that's our, our position, but we, we encourage uh, traditional medicine. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, DG. We will uh, conclude the press conference here. Uh, audio file will be sent to you shortly, as well as the opening remarks of DG. Transcript will be available, most likely. Uh, tomorrow, we have also just sent you an invitation for the press conference of our regional office in Americas that will take place uh, tomorrow. I wish everyone a very nice evening. So, Tariq, uh, thank you very much. And um, thank you all for uh, joining uh, today. And look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. Thank you so much.